so happy to be here. Thanks for the uh, invitation. Um, yeah, and I'm really excited to tell you about uh, also an antimicrobial resistance related story, actually two stories today, um, where basically the theme is that the environment shapes susceptibility. And um, I'm very interested in what's happening inside of the cell metabolically, how is the metabolic profile changing depending on the environment. So there's actually two stories I want to tell you about today that are ongoing work um, that sort of deal with this topic. Right. So the first story I'm going to tell you is sort of um, yeah, titled Uncovering the Role of Metabolic Adaptations in the Emergence of Pre-Resistant Bacterial Populations. And it's basically a question of like, how does the metabolic environment shape these differential metabolic profiles and therefore also the responses to antibiotics? Um, so let's just think about it this way. Um, so we take a bacterial cell, any bacterial cell that you can just imagine might be a pathogen. Um, and it is growing and metabolizing some sort of carbon source, uh, for instance, glucose. Um, and it's just running sort of its normal metabolic processes, glycolysis and what's um, all, all of these things. Um, and now an antimicrobial compound enters this mix, taken up by the bacterium. And then basically a stress response is triggered, right? which I try to sort of show here with these arrows that are sort of up and down regulated. Um, so what kind of stress responds and to, to the degree that it responds, that's kind of depending on this metabolic memory of like what has the cell been doing beforehand, like metabolically. Um, so this is how I started this project. So sort of thinking about, um, thinking about that cells actually di live in different, um, yeah, environments, even within the body in an infection niche. And because of that, they actually might respond differently because their metabolic profile of like how they've been living basically beforehand in this particular environment shapes how they might respond once this antimicrobial compound comes in. And this is actually quite relevant because if you look at these um, different lists that you may know of like different pathogens, they're classed in different um, types. So the WHO put out this priority pathogens list a few years ago. And actually on the critical um, priority list, um, we have Abermanii, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and the whole uh, clade of Enterobacteriaceae. And as you can see on the table on the right, they actually managed to live in a lot of different infection sites. And I've just picked a few that are very common, like just show very common infections. So the respiratory tracts, your, um, your lungs, urinary tract, and gastrointestinal tract. And so basically in this project, what I did is I chose these like basically representatives of these three different um, priority pathogen clades and wanted to check out how are they dealing with antimicrobial um, like exposure once they've been sort of growing or living in this environment that mimics one of these different infection niches. So the way we did this is basically using different media because here we can very much contro control what are the nutrients in the media, what's the pH in the media, and we can do that with sort of standard laboratory um, mechanisms or experiments that we know where we just used LB or minimal medium that everyone has used before, but we will also end up used um, infection mimicking media. So something that we call synthetic sputum and synthetic urine. So here the metabolite composition and the nutrient composition is very similar to what um, this bacterium might see once it infects the lung or the urinary tract. And we ended up using eight different clinical um, antimicrobials. So these are sort of selected on what are the ones currently in use against these three different um, priority pathogens. And basically with this data set, we then wanted to figure out, okay, what's happening and when, once they start to see antimicrobials. And I'll walk you through this um, bit by bit. So here's just sort of um, a, an array of different growth curves that we sort of um, acquired using antimicrobial exposure. So basically what you see, you see your coli growing, and then we start hitting them with the antimicrobial at different concentrations. So um, basically higher and lower concentrations based on a sort of MIC that we got from the UCAS list. And um, these are just general response curves. But what we can do with those, we can actually like sort of calculate the cutoff values of when, when we actually hit an inhibitory concentration. And so we do that using these, um, um, those response curves, and we can do that for all different types of, um, of the different um, antimicrobials that we used, and basically get these profiles, and that tells us, okay, now we have an inhibitory concentration, and we sort of see how they respond. And this we can do for all three different of the, of the different um, priority pathogens, and you can tell that 
the way they respond is sometimes very similar. Like say, for instance, on the, on, if you look on the right, the top right here, oh, I guess I have the pointer right here. Callistin is something where I guess all three different species do react very similarly, but then we do have other antimicrobials, like for instance, astreonam or ceftazidime, where they do respond quite differently depending on which um, um, pathogen we're using. And this is something that we did expect. I mean, we expected Pseudomonas, which is sort of the bluish green one here, to be um, kind of res more resilient against some of these compounds than others. However, as we moved on, so this is all done in this one medium called MHB. It's usually used in sort of microbial clinical labs to figure out how, what is the resistance of a strain. Um, so, but as we moved on and did this in all different types of media, we obviously acquired a lot of different profiles. And if we then do these dose response, this dose response curve and figure out, okay, what's the inhibitory concentration, we can actually scale all of that to this initial finding in MHB and create a heat map. And what we ended up seeing is that depending on the medium that we're using, or basically the environment that it's mimicking, we actually see very, very different responses to the antimicrobials. And this is um, the scales on the next slide. Um, so I can show you that here. This is twofold changes, log two um, of those changes. So basically, we have sometimes like crazy amounts of the antimicrobial that we need, um, needed to use in order to inhibit growth in some of these media. So given that currently how this happens in hospitals that we only use one kind of medium in order to figure out is the strain resistant or not, I think this is a very important message to get out there that really wherever the pathogen is growing will have a huge impact on how they respond to the antimicrobial. And we didn't just see this for E. coli, we also did see this for um, Pseudomonas and A. baumannii. And while this heat map is a bit all over the place, I think one take home message is that um, so these, these um, media are sort of um, ordered in a way that we have at the bottom, we have the sort of lab media that we know, and at the top, we have the more sort of infection mimicking media. And especially for Pseudomonas and A. baumannii, which are very, very tricky in hospital settings, we see sort of an up, like they need, we need higher antimicrobial concentrations in order to inhibit these bugs um, in these sort of infection mimicking media. So this is sort of um, summarizing the first part, this first story where we do see that different pathogens um, actually colonize in very different niches and that we need to think about these niches when we think about antimicrobial testing. Um, and we, we, we know that pathogens respond differently to different antimicrobials, but what's the big take home message is that once they've been grown in a different environment, once they've seen this environment, they've sort of adapted to this environment, the way they then end up responding to the antimicrobial differs quite a lot. Um, so it's something to keep in mind going forth, I think. Right, and I'm gonna switch gears now and talk briefly about a second project that I've been working on, which is um, sort of branching out even more where we're actually using different microbes, very different microbes, cross kingdom interactions to figure out what's going on metabolically. So we know that um, basically, a lot of infections are actually polymicrobial um, and they're often cross-kingdom. Cross-kingdom meaning, you know, I've got bacteria in there or maybe fungi or viruses. And all of these different microbes will interact and will influence each other. And um, as a good example for this are the lungs of um, cystic fibrosis patients. Um, these patients often carry Pseudomonas aeruginosa um, in their lungs as a, yeah, as a pathogen. But um, there's this one study that then found that simultaneously they were also co-colonized by Candida albicans. Um, this is a yeast, a fungus, um, uh, to 78% of the time. So actually a lot of the time we see both of these species occur in these patients. And um, we reviewed some of this literature last year and actually found, so this is just a summary of what we found in some of these studies, that whenever you, you do have a polymicrobial infection, you actually have higher rates of hospitalization or also higher mortality rates. Or the lung, if it's a lung infection, lung deterioration also increases. So these poly polymicrobial infections are very important to look at and we're actually starting to have the ability to actually work with those as we can sequence them better and as we can figure out what kind of different species are actually in this environment together at one point. And what we know about Pseudomonas and Candida is that they actually interact a lot. So there's been some studies out there that basically their quorum sensing molecules um, sort of are sensed by each other and they do change a few of the sort of 
physiological um, yeah, characteristics that we, that we sort of know about them. So something like biofilm, might, biofilm formation might be in, influenced by that, or, or swarming or motility from the um, bacteria might be influenced by that. So we wanted to figure out does this whole concept of thinking about the environment, which now includes a different species on top of that, does that influence how they react to antimicrobials? So um, what we first did is that um, we basically produced this cell-free supernatant by first growing candida in this, in this particular experiment, candida in LB medium um, for 24 hours, then removing the cells, filtering that, and then using the cell-free supernatant to grow pseudomonas in. And basically wanted to see is there a change in how they now respond to antimicrobials? And I think um, this graph shows it very nicely where at the bottom you just have the regular LB and then um, along the y-axis you have different strains of candida. And um, you can just see these growth curves where you end up seeing that actually a lot of the time pseudomonas can grow um, at much higher concentrations of, in this particular case it's meropenem, um, if, if the supernatant was sort of first used or, or basically candida had, had been growing in it beforehand. So there must be some sort of interaction or something that's being secreted um, by candida that might help pseudomonas sort of amp up its response to these antimicrobials. We also quantified that and, and used different strains of pseudomonas. So this is P14, ST2211 and ST2274. These, um, these STs are actually clinical isolates. And we see that this response sometimes varies. So we do have Basically, for ST2211, there's not really a lot of change if we use different Canada supernatants, but we do sometimes also see like huge changes like in ST274. Um, so then we did the reverse, did the same thing basically for the fungus now, where we, here we use YPD medium, it's just what the fungi love. And so we um, grew up pseudomonas in that uh, for 24 hours, removed the cells, filtered that, and then used the cell-free supernatant to have Canada grow in it. And here we actually did two types of characteriz characterization. One, we again did these sort of um, antimicrobial growth responses that we mapped, um, but then also we used this diffusion assays. And I'm not sure how many people are uh, familiar with this. You basically create a lawn of your cells and you put this little disc in the center and this disc contains your antimicrobial compound. And as it dis diffuses out, obviously the, um, the concentration of it will decrease. So at some point there will be a concentration that you can sort of see here at the sort of end of or ring of this halo where the concentration is low enough that the cells end up growing again. And what is interesting for fungi is that um, within the first day, you basically see no growth within the halo, but on the second day, you see a lot of growth in the halo, and we term, call this tolerance. It's a bit different from tolerance in bacteria, but basically, if you see growth in the halo, that means you've got a tolerant strain. So we wanted to figure out, is there a difference in sort of the tolerance um, response? Right, so um, basically, we saw a very similar trend that basically the MIC, so the inhibitory concentrations that we use um, or that, that are needed in order to inhibit candida growth do vary a lot if the pseudomonas, um, if it was pseudomonas cell-free supernatant that we used compared to YPD, which is in, in, in yellow here. And I think what was even more striking is that if we use this sort of, um, this diffusion assay, this tolerance assay that you see here basically, wherever you have the, the white patch, that's basically the halo where the drug has inhibited. Um, and this is sort of our two day time point. And as you can see, we have a lot of growth here within the halo. If we use the supernatant, we completely clear that halo. So there's a lot of interaction between what's being secreted by pseudomonas and candida. And we could basically completely um, diminish tolerance in these fungi that are also quite infectious under these settings. So this is something that we're going to look into further. Um, we actually have a huge proteomics setup in Berlin. I'm just going to fly through a couple of the um, results from that. So we did see that in pseudomonas, virulence is actually upregulated if you do grow them together. So we, we see a lot of virulence genes upregulated up um, in general and also in the pathway enrichment that we've done here. For candida, the story isn't quite as clear. We just see that central metabolism in candida is, is vastly changed. I mean, you need to dig deeper into, into these results to figure out what's going on sort of within the cells um, as they respond to the different pathogens. 
All right, just to summarize that, um, polymicrobial infections have been overlooked and they actually often um, lead to worse patient outcomes. Um, Pseudomonas aeruginosa susceptibility actually, is actually reduced um, in the Canada environment, so if it's like a self resupinatant um, of Canada. Um, for Canada, the reverse is kind of true, or at least it's altered in many different ways. And we see that tolerance is actually reduced. Um, and ultimately, um, yeah, these dual species proteomics is something that we want to go forward with in order to figure out what's the reprogramming metabolically to really dig deep into the me molecular mechanisms. Thanks to the team in Berlin, this is like from a lab retreat that we did a couple of years ago, and also thanks to my collaborators here in Oxford, so Craig McLean and Rachel Wheatley, who've really helped a lot, especially on the second project. Thank you.